uh, IBM under the micromanagement of its uh, chairman and president, Thomas J. Watson, acting directly from New York and later through his overseas subsidiaries, uh, co-planned and co-organized all six phases of the Holocaust. The identification of the Jews, the uh, expulsion from society, the uh, confiscation of their assets, the ghettoization, the deportation, and even the extermination. The Auschwitz tattoo actually began as an IBM number. Welcome back to Enemy of the Surveillance State, where we discuss news, tips, and open source tools to help you protect your privacy in an age of mass digital surveillance. I am your host, C. Mitchell Shaw, and this week we're going to be discussing the part that IBM, a major American company, a major American tech company, played in the Holocaust of the Jews in the lead up to and during World War II. And I'm also going to make a special announcement uh, about a series that I'm going to be doing to help you de-Google your life. So stay tuned for this episode of Enemy of the Surveillance State. So that clip at the beginning was Edwin Black, author of a book called IBM and the Holocaust, um, when he did an interview uh, that is now up on YouTube. It's been up for ages. This book has actually been out for a long, long time. I think it came out in 2002 or three. Uh, there's a story behind me reading it, but I'm going to put a link in the show notes for credit uh, for where I got that sound clip. I always like to do that, uh, send you back to the original source. Plus, I don't know how much work it takes to to create good content. You may disagree and think, wow, Mitch, I, I wish you'd start creating good content. But but that's an argument for another time. Uh, but because I do recognize that, I always want to give credit uh, where it's due for anybody who has created content. If I use a snippet of that content for this podcast for transformative purposes. So the book, uh, IBM and the Holocaust, like I say, came out in 2002 or three. Uh, I'm also going to put a link in the show notes for where you can get a copy of this book on Amazon. That's not an affiliate link. I, I don't have an affiliate link with Amazon or anything like that. But if you don't want to buy it from Amazon, there are other places where you can find the book, but at least you'll have the ISBN number and you can do your own research and find the book. Uh, like I said, it came out in 2002 or three. Uh, I only discovered this book about a year ago when I was um, out at a park uh, with some family and this was in one of those free library, take a book, leave a book places that you know kind of look like birdhouses, but they're for books. I think those are so cool. I'd love to put one of those right at the end of my driveway. But then, you know, having people traipse in and out of my yard all the time to grab stuff, I think would probably drive me crazy. At any rate, grab the book just because I thought it was a fascinating uh, concept, kind of thumbed through it and put it on a, a shelf of books that I intend to read. M maybe you have those uh, you know, this growing stack of books or whatever, like, oh man, I'm going to read that. And then every now and again, I'd walk past the shelf and see it and think, oh man, I'm going to read that. Uh, and a year goes by. And then recently start page, uh, which uh, if you go back in the catalog of this podcast a little bit, you'll hear where I had uh, start page. I had some representatives from start page on as guests on the show, I think that episode is called Keep It Secret, Keep It Safe or something like that, how to how to browse the web or do web searches anonymously uh, without using Google, but still returning the same types of results you would get from Google. It's a great episode, at least I thought so. Uh, the, the gals that came on were fantastic. Uh, and then um, I also later, the, the guy that helped me, um, th that sort of reached out to me about doing that, his name is Henry. Uh, he was or may still be an intern uh, for start page, but he also runs his own privacy community called tech lore. And then later I had Henry on as a guest. Uh, that's also a great episode. Go back and find that one. I'll put links in the show notes or, or some way you'll find those or just browse the browse the catalog. There are probably some other episodes that you haven't listened to that you need to. Uh, that's my cheap shot at getting you to listen to more of my episodes so that I get more downloads. Um, but so they had done a report on this and they tweeted about it. 
uh, about the the idea of IBM and IBM's involvement in the Holocaust. So I thought, oh my gosh, I've got a book about that. And before I even looked at what they had tweeted, I responded to their tweet to say, I've got a book on that topic. And I took a picture of the cover of the book and posted it. But when I went to do that, and then I checked back to make sure that my tweet actually went through, because sometimes they don't for some reason, uh, I saw that this is the exact book that they based their uh, their report on, IBM and the Holocaust by Edwin Black. Um, it is – here, let's take a look. Uh, you think I'd be prepared ahead of time, right? But I think you all know me better than that. More than 500 pages to make the case. And the case – is really what you hear Mr. Black say in that sound clip at the beginning of the episode, that IBM co-planned and co-orchestrated every phase of the Holocaust. But more than that, the book goes deeper into the part that IBM played in the Third Reich, period. So here's what here's what he says in the book, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase. I'm not going to read to you from the book. You need to read the book yourself. Um, but what he says in the book is that IBM orchestrated this, planned this, and helped execute it uh, by providing the technology that the Third Reich needed to do what they were doing. Now, what was needed for this was a computer or a supercomputer, but computers didn't exist then, not in the way that we think of computers today. But what IBM did have was punch card machines. Yes, punch card machines. Not a computer that could that could uh, crunch gigabits of data or gigabytes of data in seconds. No, no, no. Punch card machines. Paper cards with little holes that would get punched in them to stand for certain answers to certain questions or certain pieces of information or certain criteria that needed to be met. So this started with censuses. Uh, um, where's the word sensi? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, they would conduct the census, and then they had information uh, on German citizens, but they didn't have any way to collate all of that information to figure out, for instance, who are the Jews in Germany. Now, again, if someone's going to synagogue on a regular basis and you know they're they're wearing the traditional Jewish attire on certain days of the year, pretty easy to spot them, but. Hitler wanted to know more than that. He wanted to know if your great grandmother was a Jew. Maybe you're not even practicing. Maybe you've, you know, married outside uh, the Hebrew faith, or you've married outside uh, even Hebrew ethnicity. But Hitler would still consider you a Jew three, four, five generations back. So he wanted to know who are the Jews. If they're going to be my scapegoat, if these are the people I'm going to lean on and destroy, if these are the people I'm going to dehumanize and convince their neighbors to hate them, because that really is the thing. Okay. So way before the Nazis could just go up and go out and round up Jews and send them off to concentration camps and send them off to death camps and send them off to die, uh, way before they could have them as forced labor, well, let's just call them slaves, that they would work to death or just outright kill. Way before they could do any of that, they had to convince Germans to hate their neighbors just for being Jewish. So how were they going to get that information? Well, it was simple. Once you could have a group of people, a whole building full of people whose job it was to sort through that data and create punch cards. Then you feed the punch cards back through a machine that reads them. And that machine was also created by IBM. The cards, the machines that punched the cards, the machines that read the cards, all of these were owned by IBM and leased to the Third Reich. It was a money-making machine for IBM. And the chairman of the board or CEO or whatever he was at that time whose last name was Watson, put all this together in such a way that German corporations, the German government, had access to these machines that were all owned by IBM. They were the only people on the planet who could create the punch cards. So the Reich had to buy the, par the punch cards from IBM. They leased the machines to them at a hefty price. They maintained the machines, even going into concentration camps or facilities right next to concentration camps, 
to maintain these machines. So the idea that IBM didn't know what the Reich was doing with these machines would not fly. They knew exactly what was going on. Okay. And these machines then uh, were able to read that data and sort that data to say, here are the Jews. Here are high concentrations of Jews. Here are medium concentrations of Jews. Here's where there are a few Jews. Now we can go get them. Right. And that is exactly what Hitler the Nazis and the Third Reich were uh, were doing, and it was IBM that was providing them the information to do that. Okay, so this is really old information. So why is this important? Well, this is important because if we look at what the Third Reich was able to do, this is also, by the way, how they kept track of their own armies, how they kept track of supplies, how they kept track of their finances, how they kept track of documents. All of this was done. The entire company or the entire country, the Third Reich, under Adolf Hitler was run by using these machines from IBM. They were able to be as efficient as they were, build the, the air force that they were able to build, plan their bombing campaigns in, in other countries like when they bombed the snot out of London over and over and over. All of that was managed by keeping track of information using IBM's card punch machines. Okay? So... Imagine what they could have done. Imagine what a regime like that could have done if they had had access to a supercomputer or, or to an average, a laptop today, a, a smartphone today. Uh, if they had been able to use the technology that we use today, there really truly might have been no stopping them. IBM played a part in this in the same sense that today, and here I'm going to get a little bit political, so y'all just bear with me, okay? Because I don't care for the sake of this conversation where you fall on the political spectrum. This ought to concern everyone because if you are okay with Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Twitter and a thousand other big tech companies being able to harvest and collate data and create startlingly accurate profiles of nearly every person on the planet. But here, I'm just going to focus on what's going on in the United States because I'm here in the United States. Now, I know many of my listeners are abroad and God bless you. Glad to have you listening. Uh, by the way, I'll take this moment to say um, that you need to give some consideration. I hope you will give some consideration to supporting the show on Patreon uh, I know it's been a little while since I've done a podcast, but since my last podcast, right about Christmas time, I've had a daughter get married. I contracted COVID. Then I had my appendix out and I'm preparing to move house. Uh, we are moving to a coastal area in the Carolinas. Uh, I'm going to be about that vague and nebulous about it because I, I don't want people knowing exactly where I live. Uh, we currently live in the Richmond, Virginia area, but we're going to soon be moving uh, so I've had a lot going on and it has prevented me from doing an episode. So I'm back. I'm trying to do this and I'm going to be doing a, another special series starting in the next couple of weeks, uh, hopefully, God willing, on de-Googling your life, how to replace services that you are using on a regular basis that are driven by Google, Google Maps, Google Calendars, Google Documents. Google as a search engine, all these Google things that we use, Android, if you're an Android user, uh, all these different things that we use that are controlled and maintained and surveilled by Google. I'm going to do a whole series on how to replace those. So uh, jot down this email address, enemy of surveillance at protonmail.com. And if you've got a particular Google service that you rely on, and you say, gosh, Mitch, I really just don't see how I could do without this particular thing. Shoot me a couple of sentence email and just say, hey, Mitch, uh, here, here's the thing that I use. Would love to know about an alternative to this that is privacy friendly and I could get Google off my phone or out of my computer or whatever. Uh, let me know because I want to make sure that I address the things that are important to all of my listeners. So anyway, back to what I was saying. Here in the United States, we've got these major corporations, these major tech companies that are not unlike IBM back in the 30s, uh, that are very good at grabbing all of this data. And no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, it is important to reflect back to what I said a moment ago, that before the Nazis could round up Jews, before they could send them off to concentration camps to die, 
which is an atrocity. Now, look, I, I'm going to come right out and call that what it is. And I know that the, the popular thing today is accuse everybody who disagrees with you about anything of being a fascist, right? So liberals and conservatives both do this. We all do it. We all say, uh, well, you know, uh, Donald Trump is a fascist and all of his supporters are fascists if we're liberal. And if we're conservative, we all say, uh, you know, well, you know, look at, uh, you know, Twitter is, you know, they, they've dumped all these accounts. They've, you know, Google or YouTube have, have, uh, deleted all these accounts and banned all these conservatives and you know, they're, they're fascists. That's not what I'm doing because I don't care if we use the term fascist. I don't care if we use the term Nazi. I don't care if we use the term communist. I don't care if we use the term socialist. I don't care if it ends in ist or ism. And it's about big government having control over the lives of individual citizens. I'm against it because my thing is Liberty. My thing is freedom. And that is why privacy is so important to me. So when we live in a world where someone can get fed through a chipper shredder by cancel culture for saying something that somebody else disagrees with, you know, there's a difference between hate speech and speech that you hate. Okay. There's a difference. And before the Nazis could go out and round up all the Jews, they first had to dehumanize the Jews to their neighbors and convince their neighbors to hate them. And that is not a lot different. It is not a one-to-one -one comparison, and I'm not making a one-to-one -one comparison. I'm not trying to be inflammatory. I'm not trying to be controversial, but that is not unlike, it is too much like what is going on today with this huge divide between Americans about everything. We've gotten to a place in American culture in American society in the way that we interact with one another where all I need to know about somebody to decide whether I like them or hate them is a three by six bumper sticker on the back of their car for a candidate that I like or hate or a political position that I agree with or disagree with. You pull up behind somebody at a traffic light and you're a you're a big Trump guy and they've got a Biden sticker on their back windshield or on their back bumper. You either hate them or you at least assume, oh, that guy's an idiot. Right. Vice versa. If you were a big Biden supporter and you pull up behind a car and they've got a Trump Pence bumper sticker on the back of their car, you know, right away, guys, a fascist and a racist and a knuckle dragging idiot. And I either hate him or I at least think he's stupid. And we have to get past that and stop being divided across all these lines. I'm not saying principles don't matter. I'm avidly pro-life. OK, I, I cannot understand the pro-choice position. I have tried. I've had conversations with people, cordial conversations, a few. Most of them get escalated very quickly into I'm a Nazi or I'm a fascist because I'm pro-life, pro right? But I think these things matter. And I think that things that matter, we have to be able to discuss and we have to be able to discuss them openly. So we've got these major corporations that not only are surveilling everything that we do, but they are also canceling people. They are nuking accounts in droves. And here's the thing, as a conservative, as a Catholic, as a pro-life guy, as a guy who on most issues would pretty much be, you could call me a conservative and I wouldn't argue with you. I'm, there's some issues like war. I'm anti-war. So that's, you know, that's not really a conservative issue. Uh, I'm obviously anti-surveillance. That's not really a conservative issue. Sadly, too many conservatives are perfectly okay with reading everyone's emails, browsing histories and everything else, because we've got to fight those terrorists and we've got to this and we it's it's either it's either to get the terrorist or to protect the children the, that's the only two wrappers that anybody has for anything anymore okay so as a conservative catholic christian as a pro life advocate i think these things matter and i think we have to be able to discuss them because as that guy if you are an lgbtq plus liberal pro choice democrat I don't want your voice silenced. I want you and I to be able to have discourse. I want you and I to be able to interact in person, on the phone, on internet platforms, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. I want to be able to let you make your argument and not shout you down to silence and not have you banned from the platform because 
Ideas that have legitimacy will stand up to scrutiny. We don't have to just silence them. And I hope that if you are that LGBTQ plus pro-choice liberal Democrat, you don't want my voice silenced. I don't think that. I think that I see the evidence too often that that is not the case. So my plea, my call to action is let's stop silencing one another. Let's stop empowering companies like Google, companies like Facebook, companies like Twitter, and keep filling in the blanks. Let's stop empowering them to shut down dialogue. And let's stop empowering them to surveil everything that we do. Because what happened in the 1930s in Germany could happen again. And okay, fine. I'm not saying it'll be the Jews again. God forbid. Maybe next time, God forbid, it'll be Catholics. Maybe next time, God forbid, it'll be Protestant Christians. Maybe next time, God forbid, it'll be Eastern Orthodox. Maybe next time, God forbid, it'll be the LGBTQ people. Maybe next time, it'll be blacks. Maybe next time, God forbid all of this, it'll be Mexicans or Chinese or whatever. But it could happen. And it begins with allowing and empowering these companies to surveil everything we do and put that information together so that some regime later on in the future can read that information and do what they want to with it. And it begins with allowing these companies to silence the voice of anybody who is off of the reservation as they see the reservation, right? So here's the thing. I have listeners that I hope I have listeners that I know disagree with my political position on things. I hope I have listeners that disagree with my religious views, because while I think those things really, really matter, they don't matter to this conversation, because this conversation is that because those things really, really matter, we have to be able to discuss them in a calm, rational way. And arrive at some kind of understanding that, hey, just because you see this differently than me, it doesn't make you evil and it doesn't make you stupid. And it doesn't mean that your voice should be silenced. Let your argument stand. I would almost advocate for a completely anonymous society where nobody knows who said what, but they hear the argument and the person making the argument, any argument they've made in the past is irrelevant. The lifestyle they live is irrelevant. What matters is the argument, the point that that person is making. Don't slay the messenger. Deal with the message. Educate yourself about why you believe what you believe. You may find that you believe some things very, very differently once you put it on the table and examine it. You may find that you really still believe it, and now you are much better positioned to defend your beliefs, to defend your position. You're in a better place to say, no, 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 here is why I believe that. Let's sit down and have a cup of coffee or a beer and let's talk about this. Let's have this conversation, not silencing the opposition, demonizing people that we disagree with, because that is a double-edged sword. Yes, in the 1930s, Hitler did that to the Jews. The Jews weren't doing that to the Nazis. The Jews didn't have a position to do that and likely wouldn't have. They were just trying to go about their lives and mind their business. And then the next thing they knew, uh, they were in concentration camps being starved and poisoned and shot. Okay. So yes, that is what happened then. But what we are setting the stage for now, if we don't turn the tide, is that some future regime, be it Republican or Democrat or something totally different, is going to inherit the powers that we have given to these major corporations and to government in their incestuous relationship with these major tech corporations to not only silence us, but to round us up if they choose to, to put us in prisons or concentration camps, to kill us. Now, maybe to you that seems like an extreme statement, but I'm going to ask you, get Edwin Black's book and read it. I, I, was, I am dumbfounded. I'm not finished with the book yet. I'm going to continue reading it. I was dumbfounded by the, the part that IBM played in the Holocaust and in 
assisting and per- supporting and protecting the Third Reich. If it happened then, it could happen again. And if he was able to do that, if this Watson guy, uh, the CEO of, of IBM at the time, if he was able to do that with punch cards, you need to stop and ask yourself, what could they do with the surveillance and the technology and the high-speed computers that we have today if the right regime comes to power? The way we prevent that right regime from coming to power is several fold. One, pull the plug on the surveillance, at least in your own life, and encourage other people to go down that trail a little bit and unplug the surveillance machine in their lives. Because until none of us are surveilled, we are all pretty much surveilled. And here's what I mean by that. It's fine. I don't have anything Google on my phone, but I have friends that do. They have, okay, Google, and their phone, bleep, bleep. And they say, call Stephanie, and it just calls Stephanie. Well, what that means is that their phone was listening to hear, okay, Google, it's always listening. And if I'm in the presence of those people, it's listening to me. If I'm at your house and you've got some stupid Alexa thing on the counter, I'm being surveilled. I've done everything I can do except burn down relationships. So we need to spread this message. We need to spread the message that it's not okay to have these devices in your home if you're going to invite friends over. People have the right to be able to have a conversation with you in private without some nameless, faceless third party somewhere listening in, capturing that conversation and hanging on to it for their own purposes. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we stop shouting down the opposition. Hear them out. I promise you that the next time I'm in a situation and someone disagrees and the whole crowd wants to shout shout them down, even if I disagree with what that person's saying, I'm going to walk over and stand beside them and say, hey, everybody, shut up. Hold on. Stop. Let's hear what she has to say. Let's hear what he has to say. And then let's discuss it on its merits, on the merits of the argument, not on my position that I disagree with you and you're an idiot and you're evil and all of the ad hominem attacks that we fling back and forth at one another. So we have to stop that. We have to stop empowering companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter to silence voices that we don't want heard. And then the final thing is we have to create an informed electorate that understands the issues at stake here. And the only way we do that is by having those conversations, by hearing someone who disagrees with you and educating yourself not only on your position on that issue, but on their position. And I have tried to do this. I I, I do not understand. I cannot agree. I cannot arrive at the conclusion that pro-choice people arrive at. But I don't think that every person who supports a woman's right to have an abortion is evil or stupid. I just think they're wrong, and I think that if we have a conversation, we'll at least be able to better understand one another. And in that conversation, if I am cordial and respectful and courteous to them, and they are cordial and respectful and courteous to me, I have an opportunity to explain to them why I think they're wrong. Okay, so all of that to say that the tech world is being built up in such a way we are creating the platform that could lead to the demise of some or many of us. And we need not to do that. The first step in that is what I just said. Have those cordial conversations. Pull the plug on the surveillance machine. Do not celebrate when your enemy's voice is silenced. Okay? So I think we've got a plan. I hope you agree with it. I hope you'll uh, consider supporting me on on, um, Patreon. There'll be a link in the show notes. Uh, I'm also going to um, put a link in the show notes to the things that I've discussed in this, the book, the video uh, clip, the sound clip that I played at the beginning from that video. And uh, I will catch you guys next time on Enemy of the Surveillance State. God bless you. Stay safe and don't lick any doorknobs. (laughs) 